Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the Milwaukee Art Museum. I'm Amy Kirschke. I work in the Education Department, and I'm so delighted you're all here today. I understand we have some exciting sports events on this afternoon, um, but we're the winners because we get to uh, be here for this wonderful talk. And I'm, I want to thank first and foremost Chipstone Foundation uh, for partnering with us on this event today, as well as Boswell Book Company, um, who will be who are selling the books and who will continue to sell the books after the lecture and offer a book signing with our speaker and author today outside in the Galleria on the city side, Schroeder Galleria. So um, for a moment of housekeeping, I would just ask that everyone si silence your cell phones, please. Um, anything that buzzes or rings, we'd love it to be uh, silenced for the talk today. So um, today we uh, have the great pleasure of hearing from Sarah Ann Carter. Uh, Sarah is with the Chipstone Foundation, curator and director of research, and has uh, just come out with a new book called Object Lessons, How 19th Century Americans Learn to Make Sense of the Material World. And as someone who works in education, I'm just delighted for this new research. I think it's really important to the work we do in museums, but also how we think about objects in our uh, rapidly changing world and how we learn from objects, how we look to the past to inform the present, and uh, maybe some ideas for moving forward. So I'm, again, really thrilled to have Sarah here for the talk today, and I um, hope you will join me in welcoming Sarah Carter. Hello everyone, thank you all so much for coming out on a Sunday afternoon and for coming out to um, hear me share my work and really to celebrate the launch of this book. This, is, um, this book just came out last month and I'm really thrilled to be able to share it with all of you here, here in Milwaukee. And before um, I really get into my presentation, I want to begin with a few words of thanks. Um, I'm so grateful to the Art Museum and to Amy for hosting us here today. I'm also really grateful to Daniel from Boswell Books, who's outside, and for the work that he does to really encourage readers and reading and authors and independent bookstores here in Milwaukee. Boswell's is a real treasure. And I'm also very grateful to my colleagues at the Chipstone Foundation, um, John Brown, who's here somewhere, and my colleague um, Natalie Wright as well, and all the other people who work with us at Chipstone. I'm very fortunate to have, uh, to have a real uh, Chipstone family here in Milwaukee. And I'm also grateful to the many friends in the audience today from all parts of my life and from my son Paul's life. Um, we really do have a very rich and happy life here in Milwaukee, and I feel so grateful for that and for all the people who have been supporting us throughout this, um, this book's development and now its birth. And it's been a long and pretty wonderful journey here. So thanks for being here today. I hope that you will um, indulge me a little bit as I begin my talk by allowing me to have um, the pleasure of celebrating the fact that my book is actually a thing that I can open up <laughs> and um, allowing me to read. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and I should say it's taken me like 10 years to work on this in the midst of lots of other projects. So it really is a really exciting um, and special thing for me to be able to share it with you. But I'd like you to indulge me a little bit by allowing me to just read a couple of paragraphs from the prologue, um, because I think that actually will help us get us right into where we need to be to, in order to begin today, to help me really help all of us together talk through what object lessons really mean. And this was my fantasy for the book. I would like this book to arrive packed away at the bottom of a heavy box of carefully selected things. That being the fantasy, unfortunately, you just get a book. You don't actually get the box of things I'm about to describe. Each item piled on top of this narrow volume would be individually packed in its own small compartment. There would be no labels. On the way to a buried title page, you would be challenged to differentiate flax from hemp whalebone from India rubber, slate from granite, and mace from fragrant ginger. Perhaps you might stop to unwrap an oyster shell, a pair of scissors, or a hunk of porcelain. A particular item might force you to pause and to wonder 
To the curious reader, this box would be filled with both things and questions. Why was this item included? What is it? Where did it come from? Is it familiar? How is it used? These queries would not simply be about the material world, the physical qualities of the items or their potential functions. The items in the box might also provoke inquiries into the nature of knowing and perceiving. Are there patterns, absences? How does one know what an item may be? What is assumed and what is sensed? Maybe something draws someone back to a nature walk, a dusty mineral collection, a display in a museum, a grandmother's trunk, a yard sale, show and tell. And some might just wish to look closely and try to tell a compelling story. As a material prologue to this study of object lessons, this box of buried things, like the one perhaps from the early 19th century over my shoulder, would not be a metaphor, but an orientation, or the way I prefer to think of most material things, a medium for disorientation. Nearly any material thing placed at the center of one's sustained analysis may become surprisingly foreign, complex, and confusing. Upon close examination, one may discover the limits, the assumptions, and the unexamined associations that undergird what most think they know about the material world. Most significantly, the words used to identify and explain those things may be imprecise or misleading. An observer is often unable to express what he or she does not know. Object lessons were designed to address this intellectual gap by attempting to teach children how to find and express the ideas in the things around them. That was the key point of object lessons. Notions of this material and linguistic disconnect, the relationship between reality and its description, or its many possible descriptions, are key to the origins of object lessons and to the debates and transformations that surrounded this practice in the 19th century United States. To take this historic practice seriously, one must consider the potential of this interpretive unsteadiness to structure classroom pedagogy, daily life, and intellectual culture. Starting in the early 1860s, object lessons shaped the way Americans reasoned from the material world and have impacted how scholars have worked to find meaning in that world ever since. To learn how to study things was considered the best way to learn how to think, leading from close looking to critical thinking. And as you begin this book, pause and mull over the possibility that a box of things, a box of things like this one, which was used in object lesson practices in the mid-19th century, that this box of things might really be best understood as a box of ideas. And that, um, that really is at the core of object lessons and object lesson practices and the ways object lessons came to take on a number of meanings later in the 19th century. This supposition, this premise that a box of things is really best understood as a box of ideas, a box of ideas to be unpacked and unfolded and understood through your material engagement with those material things. And I began my book a decade ago with this question, this question about the relationship between objects and ideas and how we understand those relationships. And it's really at the core of my project. I'm interested in trying to figure out throughout this project and in the work I'm continuing to do, how do we begin to understand the material things and objects around us as having intellectual content? And this is the foundation of material culture studies, a field which I'm part of, but it's also really a diverse range of practices that scholars in a whole bunch of fields work with and think through. Scholars who are interested in thinking about how material traces of the past can help us understand the world that we live in and its histories. But it's also relevant to the way we interpret art. And it's relevant to the way we think about consumerism, to the ways we think about capitalism, to the ways we think about race and representation. How do we make sense of the world around us? How do we find ideas and things? That's at the core of this project. Now, these questions actually led me to a cache of sources that I didn't know existed and that I'd never really heard of. 
I started doing research for this project as a PhD student, working on my PhD in American Studies at Harvard. And I found myself in the education library there, looking at textbooks that um, had the phrase object lesson in the title. Um, you know, lessons on things, how to give an object lesson, various books and articles that got me wondering, is this actually a thing? You know, what is an object lesson? Because of course, I knew the phrase object lesson as a metaphor. It's a metaphor that we hear a lot of. It's a metaphor that if you listen to NPR long enough, you're, bound, you're bound to hear someone say, oh, this is an object lesson in good government, or more frequently lately, this is an object lesson in terrible, horrible government, or horrible things that can happen. It's a concrete example of something that helps us understand a much bigger pattern. Um, you know, the New York Times columnist Paul Krugman loves the phrase object lesson. If you look back at his columns, I think he uses the, it more than anyone um, ever. Um, at least in what I found, it's which I hope no one ever does to me or any of us to go through someone's writing and try to find the metaphor they most overuse. But that is the metaphor that he loves. So it's a metaphor that we, um, we see a lot of, but what I began to realize in my research was that that metaphor actually hid the history of an actual classroom practice. So this 20th and 21st century metaphor is only the second, you know, dictionary definition of an object lesson, you know, striking practical example or principle or ideal. That's its second definition. The first definition of an object lesson was actually an historic classroom practice, was actually the historic classroom practice that all of those textbooks that I was finding in the Ed School Library from the 19th century were describing. A lesson in which a pupil's examination of a material object forms the basis of instruction. And that history was one that was almost erased by the popularity and the ease with which people use that metaphor. And so in my research, I jumped into the 19th century and I tried to figure out what was going on. And this actually is a journey that I detail in a bibliographic essay in my book because it was something that started to be so baffling to me. How and why don't we know about this practice? You know, when was this actually a practice that was used in the 19th century? When was it a metaphor? What's the relationship between um, those two uses of the word. And to try to figure this out, I was in archives all over the US. Uh, from coast to coast, I spent several years researching this project uh, and really trying to think about, did this actually happen? You know, did people just talk about it? Or were object lessons actually implemented in the classroom? And I know there are um, many teachers in this room as well, and we all know education, learning, is hard enough to assess in a contemporary classroom, let alone a historic classroom. Right? How do we understand what people are actually learning or thinking about in a historic classroom context? That was one of my challenges in this project. And um, that was really a quite exciting research adventure. And through all of this research and travel and going through a whole range of different archives, you know, from the Huntington in California to um, New York Historical Society in New York and lots of places in between, really thinking about where and how were these lessons used and applied. Did teachers actually use them? And what did it mean to students, to their families, and to the larger context in which they were living? So I found myself trying to figure out the history of this practice. And in my research, I trace it back. I trace its origins back to the classrooms of the unorganized classrooms of the romantic pedagogue, Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. This is a posthumous picture of Pestalozzi. Like most romantic heroes, and I'm using capital R, romantic heroes of the late 18th and early 19th century, he was kind of a mess, right? He just, his shoes were always, socks were falling down, he was always giving away his shoe buckles. He actually almost died after absentmindedly running a knitting needle through his ear while scratching his head. Like, he was just a complete mess. But he was kind of a brilliant thinker when it came to pedagogy, when it came to thinking about children. And he was really quite interested in how mothers engaged with their children. And he was really quite interested in this idea of looking closely at children and trying to figure out what do they need? What are they looking at? What can we learn from actually engaging closely with children and watching the way they look at the world, the way they experience things? And as historians of education have detailed, I mean, he really developed um, some of the ways that we think about child-centered pedagogy. A lot of them can be traced back 
to Pestalozzi's ideas. His real desire to look closely and to understand, how is this child learning? What can I learn from what he or she sees? And in his teaching and writing, he emphasized the concept of Anschauung, which is a German word that is hard to translate, like many German words, but it translates roughly to a sense perception or an experience where you're physically and sensually experiencing the world. Um, so he was quite interested in that idea. How can we understand how someone is centrally experiencing the world? How can we use that as educators to help us in the work that we do? So in the model that Pestalozzi develops, you move first from sensation, so that physical sensation, that anshang of you engaging with the world, then to perception, then to a notion or an idea of what you're seeing, and then finally to volition, learning how to act morally, how to make a decision, how to make a choice, based on what you're observing, based on what you're feeling about the world. And this child-centered pedagogy linked quite explicitly learning to observe, learning to experience, learning about the world around you with learning to think and to reason. And this, this way of understanding learning has been you know, critiqued and reimagined. It was critiqued and reimagined throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century by a range of pedagogues and teachers. But that's really the foundation of object lessons. And as you can see in this posthumous portrait, he's really searching the faces of his students. He's just trying to see them and figure out what is this person comprehending? What is this child seeing? And it's in this world of kind of connection and exploration that we really imagine the birth of object lessons. And of course, he didn't invent the notion that um, children learn through their interaction with the world. I mean, we think of someone like John Locke and his concept of, um, children being uh, you know, an, a blank sheet of paper or an empty slate. But he really transformed this into a um, way of thinking about education moving from sensation to volition in some pretty fascinating ways. But as I mentioned, this guy, you know, while he's this fascinating thinker, he's really unorganized. You know, he can barely get himself dressed in the morning. His schools are pretty much a mess, even though lots of interesting learning is happening in them. He's not an administrator. He's not someone who's able to organize his thoughts. And he's smart enough to realize that he can do that by bringing in a whole range of students from all over Europe and some from America. So he brings in these students who are ambitious students who want to become teachers, and they take the best parts of his methods, and they translate them into methods that can be scalable and used in a whole range of classroom and teaching settings, really all over the world. Um, and his students were able to transform this idea of moving from sensation to perception to notion and finally to volition into systems, which can really be scalable. Of most importance to my study is a young man named Charles Mayo. And Charles Mayo, um, he was English, he spent two years with Pestalozzi and then goes back to England where he opens up a school with his sister Elizabeth Mayo, the home and colonial school society in, um, in London. And working with his sister Elizabeth, um, and she probably did most of the work actually, um, she wrote many of the books that the society is known for, though she did not study with Pestalozzi, um, her brother did. They were able to develop a scalable system a scalable system that could help teachers actually move from some of Vestalozzi's very basic ideas all the way through an understanding of how to apply and use those ideas in a school setting. One of the main problems that they were trying to solve in doing this was the problem of rote learning, which was viewed as a real problem in the 19th century United States. This idea that children were learning to memorize, that they were learning just to take in information and parrot it back taking information and parrot it back, which is not a model in which you're really learning how to think, how to take that information in and to transform it into a new set of ideas, or to learn how to act morally or to make decisions based on that information that you're taking in. They were really interested in trying to develop a way in which children could learn about, <clears throat> could learn about the world through their senses and through that kind of engagement, and then through understanding, almost what we would think about as critical thinking in the 21st century, move from there to make decisions and to better understand the world they were living in. And this was often brought up as a problem at moments of real um, political crisis. Like for example, in 1848, when revolutions are rocking through Europe, 
there's this argument, we need to teach children how to think not with rote learning, but through um, various modes of pedagogy that can help them learn to think critically. In the US context, it's become something that's talked about a lot during the American Civil War. The idea being, um, if only we had learned how to think critically, how to look closely, how to make connections, we could have avoided this national crisis of the Civil War. So object lessons are often brought up in that context. It's really about learning how to think. And the tools that people suggested, that Elizabeth Mayo, her brother Charles, drawing on Pestalozzi's work, the tools that were employed to do this were tools like this one, boxes of objects that could be employed to teach children how to look closely, how to observe, how to make connections between objects and ideas in the classroom. So, for example, I'm just going to walk you through a classic object lesson. You would start with observation, looking closely at something. You would then study an object for its qualities. What are the qualities that makes this what we say it is? Then you would study the object for its qualities that cannot be discerned merely, merely through the senses, through observation. Then you would classify objects, try to figure out well, what is this thing that I'm looking at? Does it fit into a category? Can we understand it in a new way? And finally, you would write about it. So key to object lessons was actually moving from close looking and observation through developing a composition, through turning that thing quite literally into a text that could be shared in a new way. And that's also really key to our understanding this practice. So if we were to do an object lesson on something like ginger, which is actually a common object lesson. We would have to describe the ginger. And actually, I love teaching with ginger when I do object lessons in my own classes because it's, um, students love to be able to do all of these things, even though they've eaten ginger many times, to be able to think about what would it mean to study this substance that we engage with all the time as, as some kind of, um, as, as evidence of some aspect of the world. So if we were to look closely at ginger, we'd describe it, try to figure out what we were looking at. Some of its qualities, it's opaque, you can't see through it. It's aromatic, it's rough, it's pulverable. Those are some of its material qualities that we can figure out by looking at it. If I were to say, here's this substance, describe it. Come up with some qualities that describe that substance. But then there are also qualities that could be described as accidental. Qualities that we can't see by looking at it but qualities that I can still teach you about that object or that substance. Ginger is foreign if you're someone living in England or later someone living in the US. It's imported, it's medicinal. Those are cultural contexts for that ginger. You can't see those qualities in looking at them, but an object teacher could teach you to see those qualities in that object, could teach you to connect that material thing to some of these abstract ideas. Ideas that you can't get just through the senses. Finally, you would sort it into groups like spices or something else, and then you were to write about it. A lesson like this one helps us understand and begin to get into some of the complexities of this pedagogy, <clears throat> which we'll be talking towards throughout our time together today. To be able to look closely at something and come to a conclusion through an object lesson that it's foreign. That's a way of connecting something to that object that becomes part of that thing that is not physically there. It's a way of connecting an abstract idea, a category, to that material thing. And it's a way of suggesting that that abstract idea might actually be a quality of that material thing. Um, that really gets us into different ways of trying to understand some of the cultural work that object lessons did. That gets us to think about how object lessons weren't just about close looking, but also came to make arguments about material things and quite controversially about people and about what it meant to be a citizen or to look like a citizen in different contexts. So these lessons were designed to be applied to a whole range of things, perhaps to consumer items like the scissors, that you see over my shoulder, to watch glass, to honeycomb, to substances and objects that you could purchase, substances and objects that you could gather. The idea was to begin to apply these lessons to all of the things that were around you in your world, 
to teach you how to look closely, but also to understand the ideas that those things might imply or teach you about the world. Now, object lessons start to become extremely popular in the US, actually in 1860. They're brought to the US by a man named E.A. Sheldon, who um, started a normal school in Oswego, New York, in upstate, in upstate New York, really right across, um, right across the lake from Toronto. And he went to Toronto and saw all of these fascinating object lesson teaching aids, and he decided he wanted to bring them to the US. And actually, it is through the Oswego Normal School, which would become SUNY Oswego, that object lessons spread throughout the United States through the teachers trained in that school. And Sheldon liked to imagine the power of object lessons this way. And this tree was one of his favorite ways to visualize what object lessons allowed for. We would start at the bottom of the tree through education of the senses, going up the trunk through perception, and then branching out into all of these ways of thinking. But all of it is rooted in education of the senses. So ideas about cause and effect, um, ideas about um, perceptions of difference, all of those things, Sheldon argued, were rooted in our understanding of perception and the senses. And Sheldon's real innovation not only was you know, writing about and coming up with all of these ways of um, further organizing object lesson pedagogy was he fitted into the US common school system. So within a couple of years, object lessons are in common schools across the United States. And when you look at school curricula and calendars throughout from the 1860s through the 1890s, you will uh, more often than not see classes devoted either every day or multiple times a week to object lessons, actually as a part of their curriculum, along with reading and writing and arithmetic. Object study was a part of that curriculum. And in my work, it was quite important to really understand that, to understand that this wasn't just a set of ideas that were abstract, but that it was actually applied, and that it actually was used in the classroom. Because we think a lot about the relationship between something that is prescriptive, something that is supposed to happen, and something that actually happens. And so I spent time looking at the papers of student teachers and teachers. This is an example of a student teacher notebook from Hunter College, um, which was the New York City Normal School, in which teachers are trying to figure out, how do I apply these lessons? How do I actually do this? How do I make this work in my classes? And teachers are really working to apply and to use these methods. And you know, within a few years, object lessons are across the US. Um, they're being used in a range of classrooms and in a range of ways. You know, here, for example, you have you know, teaching aids that were made for this kind of pedagogy and an example of a teacher, from, in this case, from um, a New York City school for African American students using this uh, method, holding up this sphere and comparing it formally to the globe on the ground to develop this concept of what is a sphere. Or in other classes, this is um, an object lesson on turtles which was also given in, in this case, another New York City schoolroom. They're an important reminder that even as you're studying objects or natural history specimens, the room in this case is also surrounded with a range of posters and other kinds of teaching aids that supplemented and helped teachers do this kind of work. So there's also a whole range of object lesson teaching aids that can help us understand how this way of moving from observation to composition from close looking to making decisions and to writing also impacted the way 19th century Americans talked about visual culture, also impacted the way 19th century Americans talked about images. We see this in examples of hybrid object lessons. Like this um, is a truly bizarre set of object lessons where it was actually fairly popular but bizarre to me when I found it, where there are a series of cards, these large cards, that also have objects glued onto the surface of them. So they're truly hybrid object pictures. And you can imagine when I found this in an archive at Princeton, I was quite surprised to find a cookie sitting inside of an acid-free box. Um, and I was really quite amazed that it was there and they clearly have the most amazing storage in the entire world. That no one ate this cookie over the course of the 75 years it was there. Um, but these kinds of objects really taught children to think about what kind of information does a thing give you versus an image of a thing. 
And this was actually a conversation that was happening in these classrooms. Like, what does it mean to have an actual cookie or shafts of wheat or pasta or a plate of straw that's been braided or, bizarrely, um, a specimen of paper made from wheat glued on top of a card, which presumably is also made from some kind of natural, which is also made from some sort of natural material. These lessons were supposed to really teach you to look differently at everything that was around you as a source of knowledge and to think about everything around you as a way to develop a whole range of ideas, ideas that you could see, but also ideas that could be connected to maybe what you can't see, but what is still there within that thing. In other cases, an image might be necessary, like this giant bell in the middle, but then on either side of it, you have, you know, or you have um, smaller objects that could be made out of tin or, or, um, or pewter. These sorts of lessons were really designed to help children understand the commodities around them as, um, as things that were produced, that were made, um, that didn't just appear, and that had stories and knowledge embedded in them. The practice was also very explicitly applied to the study of images. And in, um, in my book, I look at how this connects to the ways we understand 19th century visual culture and the ways we talk about 19th century art because I think there is a viewing culture that object lessons actually really quite consciously suggests, one that um, connects close looking and what you're seeing in those images to a whole range of ways of interpreting those images, but I won't, I won't get into that today because that's much more of an art historical intervention. Um, but in these lessons that were used in the classroom, the idea was that children would look at these scenes observe these scenes, go through a series of lessons around these images, and then think about the kinds of decisions that they would make. So for example, here, children were supposed to look closely, and then they were supposed to work to develop the conception of what blindness might be. And of course, in the 21st century disabilities context, this seems somewhat ridiculous, but children were told to close their eyes, to cover their eyes, to walk around the room, to try to imagine what that was like in the context of this image and then to think about what decisions would they make when faced with a scene like this. The idea was trying to take an image and make it bodily and concrete in a way. Or to be able to look closely at an image like this and to understand what made this a happy family. What do we see in this scene that suggests there is order rather than disorder? That there is structure, that you know, is, is, the, is the cup in the saucer? How do we understand this family? What can we look closely? How can we look closely at this image and understand what's happening here? And there are detailed lesson plans that go along with images like this that can then be used almost as a key to help us understand how 19th century genre paintings were looked at, that can help us understand how a whole range of other images were understood within this viewing culture. Teaching aids explicitly about work and about the productions of object, production of objects were also quite popular and were made explicitly as, as object lessons, as object teaching aids. In this case, children were taught to see the kitchen as a site of work, which always seems slightly radical to me. Um, but to understand that as, as a site of work in which objects are produced, in which labor is done, in which things are made, and how can we understand the work that goes on in that space? How can we see something like the clock on the wall as a tool? Which of course, it's a crucial tool for a cook. But how can we begin to understand the kinds of stories that are embedded in these images? And object lessons actually, there's a method, that there's a lesson plan that goes along with this particular image that includes going to visit a kitchen, looking closely at the kind of work being done, the tools that are being used, returning to this image with that knowledge of those tools, and then thinking about how that changes the way you see this image, and eventually writing about it. Or something like this, um, this lithography studio, in which children were taught to you know, look closely at this image and to understand the various stages in the making of a lithograph, to visit a lithography studio, to understand what lithography was, and then to apply that way of learning and analysis to the lithograph, this is a lithograph, that they were being told to study in the classroom. So at the core of object lesson pedagogy is this desire to make students hyper aware 
of the material world around them, where those things came from, who made those things, how those things could be made and understood. And at the core of that, there's this idea of understanding those objects is almost a crystallization of labor. There's very much like a Marxist thread, thread throughout this that you're thinking about these things as not just being a material thing, but one that crystallizes and congeals and brings together the labor of many people who work on those objects. And part of this is intended to make that visible even to young children, to help them understand and talk through how these things are created and the kinds of ideas or stories that can be in the objects around them. You know, another example in that vein, like type metal, the cards that they're studying from are obviously printed. So what does it mean to take a card that is a printed card and to say, we're gonna teach you how this card was made that you're looking at? Again, this awareness of media, this awareness of how everything around you is created. And there are lots of other ways in which object lessons were used too. They were used in schools for the blind and deaf blind and deaf. This is an image from the Perkins School for the Blind in Boston, where object lessons are used for students with a range of abilities. And object lesson pedagogy also becomes, um, it becomes something that eventually is connected um, through Pestalozzi's students and their students to the kindergarten movement. Um, kindergarten actually intellectually is an intellectual descendant of object-based teaching, as is Montessori. And so we can think about this whole range of object-based practices that comes out of object lesson pedagogy. But of course, it's not all, um, all of these practices have complexity and these practices are not all necessarily positive and we have to think about them um, in a more nuanced way. So for example, I also write about the kitchen garden movement, which um, is a very little known movement that became quite popular in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s as a variation on kindergarten. This is a movement that used all of the same methods of object lessons and object teaching, but used it to train servant girls so that they would actually know what it felt like to be servants, so that they would understand how to look closely, how to make sense of when something was messy or clean, um, how to really engage, um, engage properly in the material work of being in service. And these were classes that were used for um, uh, basically girls from modest backgrounds throughout um, cities in the Northeast of the United States. And they were also established in Belfast and Ireland with the idea of intercepting servant girls before they immigrated to the US. So they could learn through modified kindergarten methods, kitchen garden methods, what it felt like to be in service. And these are the kinds of materials that were used in kitchen garden work. And in these methods, um, the same kinds of songs that were used in kindergarten work, songs about brotherly love or the cuckoo, songs that we played on the piano, were adapted to teach girls what it felt like to be in service. So that actually knowing whether or not soup was too salty or whether the dishes were straight or whether things were properly folded were bodily and material skills they were developing that could become qualities of them. You know, one verse from one of those songs, um, you know, this to straightness trains our eyes and we quickly gr grow so wise so we'll only take a moment's look to see the slightest turn or crook. So these same methods, which could be deployed to teach children how to think expansively, how to think creatively, how to make great decisions, could also be used to teach children how to, how it felt, what it felt like to be a servant, what it felt like to inhabit a particular social role. And many of the lessons also had really quite serious racial complexities that are important for us to think about. So for example, a lesson on cotton in New England or in upstate New York, where object lessons were quite popular, was really about being a consumer it was about understanding where that cotton came from and understanding the different kinds of materials that you, uh, you could purchase, that you might want to purchase. But when these lessons were given um, to recently freed African Americans or the children of freedmen in the South in the years after the Civil War, those lessons were quite different and looked quite different and suggested a different relationship between the students, the materials, 
and the kinds of ideas that they were being taught through those materials. So in this case, rather than finished commodities, you know, there's a pile of cotton on the table. <coughs> Excuse me. Or in this case, this is a scene from um, the Hampton Institute, which I'll talk about in a moment. The children are being taught how to take um, balls of cotton and sort of roll that raw cotton between their fingers. That's a very different kind of object lesson activity. That's a very different um, set of sensory lessons that they're learning through that. And I think that's an important reminder of all of us who are thinking about object-based learning in different contexts. Object-based learning, just like textual learning, but in some ways more so, we are engaging with histories of race and class and access to things in ways that we have to be very attentive to in the work that we do. And this is a scene from um, the practice school at the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute. Um, the Hampton Institute in Virginia was a school that was initially founded to um, educate recently freed slaves. It was also a school that um, educated Native American prisoners of war. And as a school that was a normal school, and by normal school that means it's a school for teachers as well, um, object lessons were part of that curriculum. But quite controversially at Hampton, students were taught via object lessons and quite literally referred to as living object lessons. In the years after the Civil War, this was a school that was for African, recently freed African Americans and Native American students, and they were learning through this pedagogy, and then they were to be set out, sent out as object lessons. As the founder of Hampton described, at Hampton there are 90, and at Carlisle, the Carlisle Indian School, an, an analogous school in Pennsylvania, there are nearly 300 Indians boys and girls who are learning civilization as an object lesson and are themselves an object lesson. So this pedagogy became a way for these students to learn about the world around them, but it also became a set of pressures and expectations that were put onto the bodies of those students for them to um, basically live and embody a certain set of, um, of material and physical values. So in this image, which has sometimes been called an object lesson or a scene from an American history class, see a young man, um, Lewis Firetail, who's dressed up in um, what actually was a costume. He's a Crow Creek suit, or was a Crow Creek suit, but he's wearing a pretty much a fictional Native American costume, <clears throat> you know, presented to his classmates, in this case, really very much as an object lesson. And for students in these schools, the idea was you very quickly gave up your Native American dress and were very quickly transformed into the image of the Americanized cadet next to me. And a big part of this process was understanding the visual argument that your body was making. And this was talked about quite explicitly in terms of object lessons, in terms of the lesson you were showing to the world through your body and the way you carried yourself. And Lewis, who was in that previous image, you know, it's shown here, this is a very poor image, but it's, um, it's one of the, the only image that survives of this particular scene. This is um, his wedding photograph. His wedding was actually reported in the New York Times, bizarrely, um, because it was a double wedding in which um, a white man married a Native American woman. And he's shown here with his wife, um, Minnie. But this is how he's presenting himself. You know, this is how he's being asked to present himself as a lesson. And so you have this real facility in understanding self-presentation and making an argument through his body and the kinds of stories that he's presenting about himself. And this was a clear moment for me in my research. And I didn't know about the Hampton story. I didn't know people would start to be talked about as object lessons when I began this project. But this is when I began to understand how the object lesson became a metaphor how it moved from classroom practice to a way to talk about concrete ideas. Because it, it wasn't talking about the bodies of African Americans and Native Americans that you see people using it both ways. And then that pedagogical side of it starts to disappear and you're just left with this idea that a person can be an object lesson without that methodological way of teaching you how that's possible. So, other students at Hampton, not just Native American students, were also referred to in that way. And this, um, you know, a quote from Booker T. Washington, that they were to, quote, send out a class of leaders 
who go out among their people as object lessons. It was a very common way to talk about the graduates of these schools. So you begin to see the metaphor taking over for the practice. Um, and then the metaphor really takes over in the late 19th century. You start to see object lessons being used in advertisements. You know, this is a so bad. And this woman there with her you know, shirt waist and skirt, she looks very much like a teacher. She's gonna teach you about the world perhaps through her soap. She's presuming that you have all the knowledge you need to understand that this is the purchase that you should make, right? This is the soap that um, if you could only look closely at it, you too would wanna write an essay about how Copco soap is the one that you should have. And we start to see it in literary sources, in advertising, beginning to become divorced from that earlier way of moving through object, through the qualities of that object, through abstract concepts, on and on. <coughs> Excuse me. It also becomes a way to talk about politics. And this is one that I wanted to bring up because it's very relevant at the moment, and then I'll just, just have um, just one final example. But object lessons actually became a key way to talk about the McKinley Tariff of 1890. Um, and it's been so funny to me listening to discussions about the current tariff situation that our country is in um, when people bring up commodities or bring up specific objects as ways to try to help us understand that tariff? Well, this was the way people talked about object lessons, and talked about tariffs through object lessons in the late 19th century. And this is an example of actually a tariff, an object lesson created to protest the McKinley tariff, and it was a tin card. It was a piece of tinned sheet iron. And the idea here was that you would look closely at this piece of tinned sheet iron, and in looking closely at it, you would not really fully be able to figure out whether it was foreign or domestic tin, because actually those concepts were so interrelated, even in the 1890s, that it was almost impossible to get to that stage in the object lesson where you understand, is this foreign or domestic? What is this thing? Um, and by holding a piece of tin, the idea was that someone would figure that out. And so there's a series of these that were made to protest that tariff. And that is kind of the same kind of logic, the same kind of reasoning that we hear when you know, someone is talking about, oh, well, if you hold up this tin can, you can understand why um, this, this, the tariff is okay, the current, current tariff situation, because it's only gonna add a penny to this, or it's not okay because it's adding a penny to this commodity or this product. That way of reasoning goes back to this 19th century way of understanding material things and trying to understand these abstract ideas associated with them. Um, and of course, there's a lot more that I write about and think about in the larger book. Uh, and there's a lot more that this, pro that, uh, there are a lot of other ways too in which this project connects to the work that we do at Chipstone, where I'm the curator and director of research. A lot of the work that we do at Chipstone and a lot of the work that I'm struggling with through the book that I'm so pleased to share with you today is about trying to understand how we connect objects and abstract ideas is about trying to understand how we make sense of the world around us and the history of that process. And that's something we're continuing to work through at Chipstone. That's something that we think about a lot in our galleries, which I hope you all visit from the second floor. That's something we think about a lot in our videos. And if you go to our videos page, we have actually a number of videos where we're trying to create contemporary object lessons, trying to think about how we can apply and use some of these methods in our work now. Um, and so that would be a way to think about some of the applications of, um, of these methods. Now, in conclusion, um, in writing this book, I really wanted to make the claim that things, that material things, that stuff, that it has an intellectual history. There's actually a history of ideas in terms of the ways we understand the material world, but we might not always see that history. And this is what I hope will be the biggest contribution of this project to the academic fields, you know, of history, material culture, art history. Those are the main intellectual fields in which I, um, I usually get to play in. Um, but there's also another register in which I hope this book matters. And 
I hope that it will make us more aware of the ideas and implications of the things around us and the ways that we, we consciously and unconsciously reason through things, the ways that we consciously and unconsciously communicate through things, and the decisions that we make about those things, whether we're making them as consumers or citizens or parents or teachers or museum curators. For me, this project will be a success if we can get us to think a little bit more critically about those choices and those stories and those ideas that we find in the material world. So I'm so grateful that you all came today um, to help me celebrate my book. And um, I would love to answer some questions if you have any. Yes. Social studies teachers are always urged to use primary sources. Mm -hmm. Could you speak on the connection between primary document sources and object collection? Absolutely. So, yes, um, he just asked if I could talk about the relationship between using primary sources in social studies classrooms and object lessons. So I went back to this image here because this actually comes from a source book of primary sources that uh, Mary Sheldon Barnes published in the late 19th century. And Mary Sheldon Barnes was actually, um, I didn't get into a lot of the biography here because we have such a short time today, but E.A. Sheldon was the man who brought object lessons really into the fore in the US. His daughter um, created some of the first textbooks of primary sources of social studies primary source books that um, were extremely popular in the late 19th century. She did this for US sources, European sources, and world history sources. The world history in that period is quite different from what it is today, obviously. Um, but she was really trying to think about how do we bring sources together that could help teachers actually have a direct experience of the past. So um, while there is a whole history within history of education of um, learning from primary sources, this was a really key moment where she built on her father's object lesson pedagogy and thought of a way to bring together a whole range of primary sources for teaching. So they're definitely related and they're very much about close looking observation, learning to draw your own conclusions. And she applied object lesson methods to the way you would study those sources. Yes. There is a connection. So Froebel um, studied with Pestalozzi. So he was one of those um, really organized young men who, like Mayo, went to one of Pestalozzi's schools and spent time there, and then was able to translate those ideas into a series of gifts, into a series of activities that went along with those gifts. Um, and his focus on unity, there's, you know, there's a lot of talk within um, like for Melian writing of, about unity and about you know the connections between all things. And when you look at those gifts, you know you have you know the three colored balls that are made out of um, that are you know knit or crocheted. You have those same balls in wood. You have those same balls in other materials. Like there's a there, there are connections that can be drawn between those things, um, and it's very much within this. It's, it's basically almost like another variation of object lesson pedagogy. Yes. Yeah, um, thank you very much. And good to see you. Uh, you talked about kind of the sort of Marxist uh, aspects of like material and labor and the rigging and the police, and also about the, um, the way that it became like an acclimation of Native Americans and so on. So like African Americans. I'm sorry, what was the word you used? Uh, acclimation? Uh, I think that's a, that's a great question um, because there are so many contradictions that are really at the heart of this kind of pedagogy and that a pedagogue on the one hand could be talking about, um, and every teacher in the room will identify with this, so I, I'm guilty of this too. Every pedagogue in the world will talk about, I want to teach my children to think, or my students to think expansively and to understand the world more broadly, but I really hope they're right, right? And so there's that tension that there's this desire to open up the world, open up the world for students and to help them see the world really broadly 
But then there's also this, um, this anxiety about what those lessons should be. And there are some kinds of object lessons where it is very regimented. Um, the home and colonial schools, which I write about in my book but didn't get to talk about today, also had a very strong evangelical aspect to it. Um, and when they translated object, the object lesson textbooks into Bengali and sent them to India in the mid-19th century, they were not thinking expansively that oh, any, any way you interpret this object is okay. No, we are going to teach you that this object is not a god. It has no meaning to it other than the fact that it's a pretty sculpture. Right? I mean, there's a clear message that some of those object teaching texts were designed to impart, right? So there's that part of it. Um, but it's something that I struggled through throughout the project, and then it's applied by lots of different people in lots of different ways. Um, in terms of the Marxist aspect of it, that's something that um, there isn't a great deal of discussion of that in the 19th century, though the language is quite similar to what you might see in Das Kapitalik. There's There are a lot of connections there. Um, and then actually recently, and this isn't in the book, but I just recently gave a talk um, at, at Yale that was a conference about the material culture of Mao's China. And actually, as you go through, and this is a, is a new direction of research for me, um, you know, reading about Mao's writing and education, he's clearly reading some of these object lesson texts, whether in German or English, and thinking about how to connect a whole range of ideas to those material things and to think about them as, um, as ways of understanding labor. Um, so, so yes, you're right to point out those contradictions. They are, they are in the 19th century pedagogy, they're in my research on it, and they're inevitably in the way we have to talk about object lessons. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's really quite interesting because the phrase object lesson really starts to fall out of favor once you get into the early 20th century. And part of that is because of the metaphor problem, where the metaphor starts to hide this, actual, er, this earlier practice. But part of it's also because John Dewey, who is someone that we know about much more in the context of thinking about um, 20th century education and sort of some of the ways objects are understood in museum context or even having a school museum. John Dewey hated object lessons. Um, part of that was because he was very much responding to some of the, very, the rote ways in which object lessons came to be used later in the 19th century. Um, I also argue that there is an anxiety of influence kind of issue with John Dewey and object lessons that actually the practice is very similar to a lot of his ideas. And so it was sort of easier for him to say, I'm totally different from this thing, which is actually very similar to me because I want to create something new, right? Um, so we see object lesson methods coming into museums in lots of ways, even though the phrase itself really stops being used once you get into the 20th century. Um, I think in contemporary museum practice, there are certainly some connections between object lessons and visual teaching strategies that can be used in v object lessons in VTS. There are actually a lot of connections within um, our history context between object lessons and the Prownian method of object study, which is a method where you go through a series of steps, starting with close looking and actually ending up with composition. That was um, created by Jules Prown at Yale about 30 years ago. They're actually, it's, they're almost identical methods in some pretty fascinating ways. So, um, for me, thinking about object lessons is really, in, some, in a lot of ways, about returning almost a prehistory to the ways we do material. It's offering a prehistory, in some ways, of the ways we do material culture and the ways we talk about objects in museums, and trying to understand that there is a much longer history to those practices, and that history can help us understand um, the ways we talk about things and the ways we talk about talking about things today. Well, I just want to thank all of you um, so much for coming out today on Sunday and um, for helping me celebrate 
this project and for asking such thoughtful questions. Um, I'm really grateful and I'm really grateful to be able to continue to work and teach with objects here at the Art Museum. So thanks. Thank you.